to everyone this evening, and if you're a guest with us tonight, we're so glad to have you in service with us this evening. Amen. If you're watching us online, wherever you may be watching from, pray that the presence of the Lord touches you tonight. I just want to take a moment and just express how deeply I appreciate the response to the services this week. We had, it's not about numbers, it's not about a crowd, those aren't, those aren't the main things that we go by, but they are something we use. And, and all three nights, and especially the Tuesday and Wednesday that are not regular service nights, we had a, we had a great response. And I just, I want to say how much I appreciate that. You, you hear, you may not, hopefully you don't, but I hear as a pastor Oftentimes, the frustration of other pastors and the lack of response and participation that they get for things like we did this week, and for you to respond the way you did. I know some of you that require schedule changes for your week and things like that. I, I, I want to say, say thank you. I, at the end of the day, there's nothing God asks of us that's too much, but that doesn't mean we still can't be appreciative. Um, and as your pastor, I am, I am deeply appreciative of, of the response this week. So thank you. And I will say again, if you, if you weren't in any of the services or if you missed any of the services, I, I really believe you owe it to yourself to, uh, to go back and listen, watch, hear what the Lord said and uh, receive what the Spirit of God was, was doing for us and in us and through us this past week. In Jesus' name, amen. First Samuel chapter number 15, and I'll begin reading with verse number 1. First Samuel 15, verse number 1. <clears throat> Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling ox and sheep, camel and donkeys. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tulane, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah unto the come, until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed utterly. Brother Owens, I apologize for this long title. They're usually short, but I want to preach to you tonight a little bit on this subject. When you spare what should die and kill what should live. When you spare what should die 
and kill what should live. God, thank you for your presence once again this evening that's been manifested in response to our worship. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in your presence. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together with people of like precious faith to worship the name that is above every name. I pray, God, that you would speak to us tonight. Lord, I know we've, we've been in church a lot this last week, and you've been speaking a lot this last week, but I pray that you would speak to us once again this evening, Lord. Not a sermon, just to be a part of this service, but I trust and pray that you would let me be a messenger to deliver a word from you tonight, Lord. I trust you for your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I think if you read, I don't know about you, but if I read throughout the Old Testament and I read passages like we have just read, it causes me to scratch my head a little bit about God. Because he's telling the man of God to tell the king to go kill everything and everybody. And you may have a different or a better explanation for this than I do, but my basic take on that and, and, underst- and finding an understanding of that is you've, you've got to remember that the Old Testament is a natural illustration of spiritual things. And so when we take the principles or when we take these stories as principles for us, Today, God doesn't send us anywhere to kill people. Paul made it pretty clear in the New Testament, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. In the Old Testament, we find flesh and blood, natural battles, but again, because God was giving us examples of spiritual things. So God gives instructions, and and Samuel relays these instructions to to Saul. And he's very clear in these instructions the Lord is and Saul is, or excuse me, Samuel is to Saul that you are supposed to go down to Amalek and and you are supposed to kill everything, everybody. Nothing is supposed to live. However, as the verses we read indicate when they went down to Amalek, Saul decided to allow the the king of Amalek to live, he decided to spare some some animals as well. If you look at verse number 9, it says, But Saul and the people spared Agag. I think that's important because we'll read in a few verses where Saul says something a little different than what it says there. So the instruction is given to Saul again, go down to Amalek and slay everything, slay everybody. It gives some explanation as to why Amalek, based on what Amalek did to Israel when they were coming out of Egypt. And, and Saul, decides to, Saul decides to have the right to modify what God said. It's a very slippery slope when you and I decide that we can edit what God said. Or we can adjust the instructions that God has given. You skip down to verse number 17 in the same chapter the Bible says where Samuel shows up to Saul after all of this had taken place. And Samuel says, when you were little in your own sight, Were you not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but You did fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought back 
and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Wait, wait a minute, Saul. You are telling the man of God that you did everything you were told to do. And in the same breath, you are acknowledging that you brought the king back. God said destroy everything. You're saying you obeyed and yet you're also acknowledging you didn't obey. And now watch this. Remember in verse number 9 it says Saul and the people spared Agag. But, but watch this in Saul's response to Samuel. Saul says, but the people took of the spoil. Sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. I I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I followed your instructions. I mean, I brought the king back, but I followed your instructions. And and all of this other stuff that was brought back, that's what the people did. Kind of takes you back to the garden, doesn't it? Eve, what'd you do? I didn't do anything. The serpent. Adam, what'd you do? I I didn't do anything. Eve. Saul, what'd you do? I I didn't do anything. I I did what you said, and but but the people decided. Saul goes on to rebuke Samuel and 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 Samuel or, or Saul Samuel goes on to rebuke Saul and 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 Saul goes on to find even more justification but, but I I did it because all these animals are good for sacrifice I I decided that you know what you know I, I, I've learned this already, and now others I know are having to. My kids are probably having to learn this with me now. You, you, you got to learn sometimes what what a person means, not what they said, because what they said don't make no sense. I don't know if he ever caught it. And I'm not making fun because I got plenty of my own mistakes. It's just kind of recent, but. But Brother Campitella said the other night that God's got all the the heads on your hairs numbered. I, it's, that's one of the, most of the time, you think sitting up here is cool, you're wrong. This is one of the worst places to sit. Because there's, there's a few folks, you, you, you don't help us out up here. I try not to look at some people, because I look at them and I'm like, I am the worst preacher in the world. I am so boring. I am so miserable to hear. I must have the most annoying voice in the world. <laughs> worship to you. I hear my wife say it. There's certain people she locks in on during worship. I just want to look at them. Look at them. Check the box. Why was I saying that? I still never, I still have no idea why I brought up the motorcycle gang this morning. I still don't know. I have no clue. <laughs> It'll probably hit me halfway through the week. <laughs> ah, I know. So you know, sometimes you you gotta you gotta help a brother out. Yeah. Yeah. God God doesn't need help. He doesn't get senile. Saul, when God said destroy everything, he knew there was animals that you think are good for sacrifice that would get killed, but God said kill it. And and yet Saul presumes to have the right to ignore the instruction of God and let some things live that were supposed to die. He presumed that he could modify what God said and, and there are some things that, you know, I know this is what God said, but, but, but I've got a better reason for not doing that. I've I've got justification for for modifying what God said. Man, we can do that all day long if we're not careful in 2024. 
with all the stuff that's going on in the world. It, it, you know, I, I know God said some things in this book thousands of years ago, but, but it's 2024. He didn't quite know where we would be. I, I, I don't think that's the case. And so, a, a king and a group of people that had caused pain and heartache to the children of Israel that God instructs Saul to deal with, Saul decides to let them live. That's chapter 15. But if we go ahead several chapters in the book of Samuel, we get to 1 Samuel chapter 22, and 1 Samuel chapter 21, David is in the process of running from Saul. In the process of running from Saul, he goes to the priest and asks for some food. And the priest gives David food for him and for his men. And so that's the, that's the context of, verse, of chapter 22, and I'll begin reading with verse number 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was... And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there was with him about 400 men. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab and he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hold. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. When Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, Ramah having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, you Benjamites, what will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie and wait as it is this, as, as at this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab, Ahitub. That's a bath that has legs on it. Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord. I'm a dad, sorry, I just have to make a dad joke. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Amalek the priest, the son of Ahitab. Yeah, and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. So, so now this this is the priest. The, this 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 is a this is a godly priest. This is not some priest for an idol. This this is a priest of Jehovah. The king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they, they came all of them to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here am I, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have you conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread? And a sword, and has inquired of God for him that he should rise against me to lie in wait 
as at this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at the bidding, and is honorable in thy house? He, he said, wait, wait, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're upset about maybe how I helped David, but, but what's wrong with that? He's, he's honorable, he's faithful, he's, he, he's, he's a good man. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die. Who are you talking to here, Saul? Who, who is it you are now swearing is going to die? Ahimelech, the priest of the Lord. But, but not just you, Ahimelech. Not only are you going to die, but all your father's house. And the king said unto the footman that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. If my understanding of that is correct, that means 85 people. Doeg killed 85 priests. What's interesting is, it doesn't just stop with Doeg killing 85 priests. Remember, Saul was instructed by Samuel, go down to Amalek and kill everything. King Men, women, animals, nothing is supposed to live. And Saul goes to Amalek, the enemy of the people of God, and decides that he's going to let the king and some animals live. But watch this, verse number 19. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he. With the edge of the sword. Both men and women. Children and sucklings. Oxen, donkeys, sheep. With the edge of the sword. Fire, fire. I'm a wet blanket on the fire now, aren't I? In one place, he's told. The instruction is, kill it all. And he decides he has the right to modify what God said. And then he ends up at the place where everything should live. And nothing should die. And the instructions that he had for Amalek, he now applies at Nob. Except the difference is at Nob, he's killing all the priests. And he's killing all of the animals that belong to them and to God. When you choose to allow things to live in your life that God says kill... 
you are going to end up killing things that God intended to live. You can't have it both ways. If you set yourself up to allow things to live that God says don't belong in your life, you will set yourself up to kill things that God intended to be in your life. Something changed in Saul. Samuel says God picked you when you were, when you were small in your own eyes. When you, you weren't arrogant, you weren't self-confident, you, you weren't cocky. But now you've, you've had a little bit of success. You, you, you've seen a little bit of good and now you're elevating yourself. Since I've already complimented you all, I can now challenge you all more freely. I, I, I've, I've, said it to my, I've said it to my son several times already. I, I, I've numerous times in the last several years, the last probably four to five years, I've, I've just thought about, I've thought about Nathaniel at, at his age and then about me when I was his age. And, and, and at the end of the day, we're all just supposed to be where we're supposed to be in God, right? We're, it's not a comparison thing, but, but, but I, I, I look at him and I look at others, but I, I've, since he's my flesh and blood, I've, I've watched him a little closer than I have most of you. Or, and, 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 and I've watched and, 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 and he's doing things that's 15 and 16 and 17 that I wasn't even doing until my late 20s, into my 30s. I, I watch some of you young people. I, it, it, took me, it took me well into probably my 30s before I had any real level of confidence in praying for people, ministering to people one-on-one. And I, I, watch, I watch some of you guys. I, I watched it just the other night when ministry was taking place during the revival service. I watched some of you young men in your early 20s. You, you are all over the place. You don't care who it is. You don't care if they're a guest. You don't care if they come. You don't care if they're leadership. You don't care, man. You just walk up and you pop a hand on their head and you start praying. It took me years and years and years to get to that point. And I, I believe that's the case. It, it happens in the natural. Just, just, just something as common as sports. I was... Brother Campatella and I were talking in one of the car rides, I think it was. You know, we were kind of just sharing things about ourselves. And, and, and we, we found out that we both, you know, back in, the, in, in our younger years, we, we both were, were fans. Our uh, Basketball was our first sport, our first love in sports. But it ain't mine. It hasn't been mine for a long time. Into my early 20s, that was, that was first basketball was first and foremost. But the older I got and the more the younger talent grew up and they did stuff when they were first starting out that I couldn't even do after 30 years of play and I was done. You watch them do stuff nowadays in all sports that compare. You ever see some of those old black and white video clips of basketball? What in the world was that? Guys run down the court and, you know, shoot the little jumper and run back. Now you guys, now you got guys, man, coming, taking off from the foul line. And of course, I watched a move the other day. This guy took like four or five steps. I don't know what that is. That's, that ain't basketball. But, but, but. Here, here's the thing you got to make sure, young people. Here's the thing you got to make sure, young adults. Is that in the process of God elevating things, and, and I, think, I think in a lot of ways because of the day and time we're living in, expediting things. If you're not careful, you can, the enemy, he's going to try. He's going to get on your shoulder, and you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, all that, all that stuff, brother. You teaches you, and all that. That's all good stuff, but he, he, you know, he's not a young man anymore. 
you, you, can, you can make some adjustments. You can make some modifications. You, it, it, this isn't really as necessary as what you were told. I know this is what Samuel said, Saul, but you know, you've, you've gotten a little experience under your belt now. You've had a few successes. You can, you can choose if you want to, to let some things live that, that God said need to die. The only problem is you're going to find yourself at some point facing some things that absolutely need to live in your life and you're going to start chopping them to pieces. Saul, when you were small in your own eyes, it was all good and, and God could use you. But now you've, you, 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 you've gotten too big for your britches and, and not only do you not do what God said, but now you just kind of do what... How, how do you go down to the enemy's city and choose to let some of the enemy live and then go to God's priests? And the very thing that you were told to do in Amalek that you didn't do, you now do except to the wrong people. What, what, what was it? I know Samuel said to Saul when you were small in your own eyes. And, and, and so, you know, that implies some pride. And so I'm, I, I would suspect that's a part of it. But, 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 but what was it that, that, that maybe that led to this change, Brother Middleton, of, of letting one thing live that God said die and killing something that ought to live? I think Hebrews gives us a little bit of an indicator of what that is. Hebrews 12 and verse 14, I'll read it from the Amplified. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. And verse 15 says this, exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, His unmerited favor and spiritual blessing. Why? In order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, hatred, shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and the many become contaminated and defiled by it. The Living Bible says it this way, verse 15, Look after each other so that not one of you will fail to find God's best blessings. Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you. For as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. I, I'm not sure exactly what point you could say it started. And again, based on what, what Samuel said to Saul, that part of the issue was that, that when you were small in your own eyes, that's when God selected you. When, when you knew you didn't have the ability, you, you didn't deserve it, that's when God picked you. But, but something has changed, but also something that changed in this process was Saul got bitter towards David. He became consumed with this passion to kill David. Rather than sending out his army to, a, to, to fight the enemies of Israel, he's sending out his army to hunt down one single man. And the, the problem with that man is he's been anointed. And yet Saul becomes consumed with pursuing David and killing David, and I believe that somewhere in there, 
There was a root of bitterness that got a hold of Saul to the point that he now could stand before the priests of God and command his men to kill the priests. Kill all the animals. Kill everything that belongs to God. Paul said in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and toward man. The word offense, according to Thayer's, means having nothing for one to strike against, not causing to stumble. Metaphorically, it means not leading others into sin by one's mode of life. It means not striking against or stumbling. It means to not lead into sin It means to be without offense, not troubled and distressed by a consciousness of sin. Vine says that word offense is an obstacle against which one may dash his foot. Paul said, I I exercise myself to have a conscience that is free from offense because I don't want there to be something that becomes a stumbling block to me or to someone else. I don't want there to be something that becomes a root of bitterness that causes trouble in others, that that causes others to stumble. I, I don't want there to be a root of bitterness that takes hold in my life that I start killing the things that need to live. Herein do I exercise, I strive, I, I pursue The Bible says offenses must come. They're going to come. But that doesn't mean they've got to become a root of bitterness in you. That that doesn't mean they've got to take root in your life and begin to influence and affect the the, the way you live, the the way you act. That Paul said a, a conscience void of offense. You've heard this before. Bishops taught this years ago. I've said it several times through the years. But that word conscience means co-perception. Co-perception. Basically what that means is your thoughts are never just your thoughts. Oh, hallelujah. Maybe I'll spice it up a little bit. Your thoughts are never just... Does that make y'all get, get, get with me a little bit more? Help me out, Nathaniel. I know, if I feel more like a Thursday night right now than a Sunday, but we're apostolic, so... We're always apostolic until we do something a little different than we're used to, and then... Wait a minute. Co-perception. I'm going to say it again. Your thoughts are never just your thoughts because you have co-perception. That means something else is influencing how you think, what you think. I don't know if it's still the case anymore because I don't, I don't use satellite radio anymore when it was newer and exciting new thing. I'd, I'd get it more, but I, don't, I'm, I, I just I don't use it. But. When I did use it, there were several places along Ritchie Highway that you learn you can count on the signal going out because it ain't picking up the satellite. You'd get in some spots where some trees were and obviously the position you were on the road and wherever the satellite was, those, those trees were blocking the connection. Those trees had become an offense. An offense breaks your perception with the thing that should be the co in your perception. Because when I have a conscience that is void of offense, 
the co in my perception is God. So what I think is influenced by God. But when offense gets in my life, I lose the co of God, but I don't lose a co. A co. Something replaces the perception that was God's place. And that's why you start thinking incorrectly and you start perceiving incorrectly. The Bible says when when your co-perception is God and the Word of God, great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. When you don't have God as your co-perception, everything will offend you. I used to just make it up kind of because I thought it was real and now I've experienced it. Or when You know, when, when, when you're good with somebody, things are good, there's no offense, there's nothing blocking the perception, you can walk right by them, not say one word to them and everything's good. But the second offense starts working, Walk by the same person for the same reasons, no ill intent. And next thing you know, you find out some point later, I knew you had a problem with me. What do you mean? Well, the other day, you walked right by me. I did? Yeah, you did. You didn't even say anything. I, I, I really wasn't thinking about it. You let the co in your perception be the right thing and somebody scowls at you and you're like, man, I guess their stomach bothering them or something. You get offended, let them scowl. I knew it, I knew it, I knew they had a problem with me. But the problem is this. Offense does not just affect your perception directly with you and God. You do not determine where the perceptions are off. And in fact, they're usually off pretty much everywhere. Because the enemy, when he gets the chance to be the partner in your perception, is looking to sow discord, is looking to make division amongst us, and he's looking to isolate us one from another. He, he's looking to get you offended with the pulpit and not hear what, what men and women of God have to say. He, he's looking to cause that barrier to come so that your perception is off. Next thing you know, you start killing what should live blows my mind how quickly people start buying in to what complete strangers tell them to what complete strangers post and people that are invested their 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 prayers and their love and their compassion in your life you start killing what they have to say You'll start letting some stranger that you got no idea what spirit's behind what they're saying. You'll start let that live in your life. You'll start accepting that hook, line, and sinker. And then those that are in your life that God put there, you'll start killing them off. There is. I, I tried, and even this afternoon I tried. I've tried to look at it a couple times. I've, I've tried to look at it in Scripture. I've tried to look at it uh, from an from a actual, just a natural perspective. But, and and I, still, I, I still can't say that I have a real grasp on it. And, and maybe if I'll just, you know, I, I think that's what Bishop says sometimes. He just starts, and then God puts all the pieces together. So maybe God will put some pieces together. I, 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 I can't I know I don't think I can fully explain this and some of you may have a revelation or understanding on this and you you can help me because I, I I really think there's a, there's an important need to get this and, and that is there there is a difference between being wounded and being offended they're not synonymous they're not synonymous. You can be 
wounded and and do what's necessary to not get offended. And and here's here's part of the natural analogy that I'm trying to get a get a grip on is you, you just because you get a cut you doesn't mean you get infected. You, you, you get a wound, you get cut. It's a cut, it hurts. But that's not automatically an infection. If you handle the wound properly, it heals. And it, it, it takes care of itself. It, it doesn't become a lasting issue. It, unforgiveness is like the infection. Unforgiveness doesn't let a wound heal. Unforgiveness keeps picking the scab off and stirring it all up again. And just because you've got some hurt and you're trying to get over that hurt, that doesn't mean you're offended. Trying to help somebody. Because the enemy wants to beat you upside the head just because you're hurt and, and you're, you're offended. You, nah, 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 I, I. So, Pastor, what's the difference? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> trying to figure it out. Somebody help a brother out. There, somebody it was in it was in one of the Oikos reports from the last the last um, the last Oikos night. And we were talking about the uh, the breastplate of righteousness. And I think I think it was brother uh, brother Vernell Spriggs that that he used the analogy in in their Oikos in their discussion about wearing a wearing a bulletproof vest. If you get if you get shot with a bullet. With a bulletproof vest, it's it's gonna it's gonna prevent you from getting killed, but it still hurts. At least it does on TV. <laughs> they groan and grunt. It takes them a while to get up. It's on TV. It's got to be true. It's got to be real. And, and, and they, somebody went on to make the point with the breastplate of righteousness that it, it stops you from being fatally wounded, but, but it doesn't stop you from being impacted. Offenses must come. But you letting them become your offense is up to you. You letting it produce something in your spirit, the next thing you know you're killing the things that ought to live. Some of you are killing the voice of God in your life through men and women that God has put in your life. You're now letting other voices live for whatever reasons, but voices that should be the trustworthy voices in your life. And do I exercise myself to have a conscience that is free, that is void of offense? I want my perceptions to be right. I, I want to know how to get rid of the things in my life that need to be gotten rid of. I don't want to reach the place where I'm deciding to let things stay that God said need to go. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm killing things. I mean, I, 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 I shouldn't go here because you know when you use certain things as an example, some people that's all they hear, and you that they think that's the only thing you're talking about. But so be it. What have we, we've been eliminating things, brother Middleton, from our, if I could say it this way, from our church life. Ah, we don't really need to do that anymore. We don't really need to go to church that much anymore. And we, we don't really need to do this. We can let this live. We can let this happen. And, and then next thing we know, we're starting to cut off. I've said it a couple different ways, but I, I, brothers, there's just a couple of just things in passing that Brother Campatella said in our conversations this week that were just such a, a great blessing to me. An encouragement to me. I wasn't prophesying. It wasn't. He didn't even. I don't think he. I mean, it wasn't even intentional. But we were. We were. I think we were in the in the drive through at Starbucks getting him a drink. 
and somehow we and and he said it. I've said it before. Sometimes I feel bad for saying it, but he said it. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much the more. The more. I, I don't understand how we're not scratching our heads going, why, why is the church getting together less and less? When we're getting closer and closer. And no, that's not all about what we do in this building. It's about what happens on a daily basis. It's what happens in organized ministry, but it's also what happens in organic ministry, where it's just members of the body that are hooking up, getting together, spending time together. I didn't mean guys and girls hooking up. I meant that just... So much the more, not the less. But when we start letting things live, that need to die. Before we know it, we'll start killing things that ought to be living. I've said this. I will keep saying it. Nathaniel, my Bible's down there, so I can't close it and put it here. So, since everybody knows the secret now, anyway, I'll just... We're going to come up with some new baseball signs. Hmm. Hopefully a few of you just went, wait, what? There's a signal? <laughs> I, 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 I guess you could look at it in sort of the context of which it happened. But I think Psalms 51 needs to be a prayer that is prayed regularly in our lives. And I don't mean necessarily just sitting there and reading it word by word repetitiously, but, but, but you, you, know, you, you, may, you may quote it the way it is, but if nothing else, the principle. Create in me. A clean heart, but also renew a right spirit. Because if I'm going to kill the things that need to die and let the things live that need to live in my life, I need a clean heart and I need a right spirit and I need a conscience that is void of offense towards God and towards man. I, I need a conscience that doesn't have a stumbling block, whether, whether that's a stumbling block ultimately for myself or whether that's going to be a stumbling block for somebody else because something in my attitude and my spirit that comes out negatively influences them. It's kind of scary that Doeg didn't have more of a conscience, more of a commitment to look at Saul and say, if you want the priest to die, you got to kill him yourself. If you want all these people of God and all these animals to die, you got to do it yourself. I'm not doing that for you. I don't have an explanation as to why he didn't do that, but he didn't do that. He facilitated Saul's. Be, be, be careful when you're hanging out with people and you're facilitating their murders. When you're killing things that they want killed, but they can, they, they can say, my hands, well, I didn't do it. I didn't spread that rumor. I didn't, I didn't criticize that person. I didn't. I, I just had Doeg do it. Better be careful. Better be careful. I believe there's some people in this place tonight, and hopefully as I've preached, whatever it needs to be, whatever it is in a personal level, but I, I believe it's, it's, only, it's only 7.35. It's still early. I, I believe there's some people in this place tonight. 
maybe just one or two, but you just, you just need to take a few moments here this evening and, and talk to the Lord and let the Lord talk to you. Are there, some, are there some things in your life that God has told you don't need to be there? Are there some things in your life that God instructed you to get rid of, to kill, that, that you've decided to live? And if you're not careful, something's taken root in your life and, and maybe you've already started or maybe you're on the verge that you're going to start killing some things that need to actually live. Just bow your head, close your eyes right where you are. If you feel a need right now to respond, if the, if the Lord is talking to you in any way tonight, you feel the need, invite you just to get up out of your seat and make your way down to this altar. If you're sitting here tonight and you know, maybe some of you already know, you're already aware, you, you've got a root of bitterness doesn't matter what the what doesn't matter what it's from. That doesn't matter what the specifics are. That that's not really the point. The enemy doesn't care what the root of bitterness starts with. He just wants to get the root of bitterness in there. He's not all that concerned with the specifics of it. He just knows the impact of it. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've got a root of bitterness that's developed in it, and, 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 the, and the source of it, the cause of it, it has nothing to do with a brother, a sister, a leader, somebody in the church, but it's still, it's still a root of bitterness. Search us tonight. Help us tonight. By your grace, Lord, don't let us reach the place that Saul reached. We presume to have the right to modify your instructions. We, we presume to have the right to do things that you've told us to do, but do them our way, the way we see fit, the, the way we think it ought to be done. And then eventually, we do the opposite and presume to get rid of things that we need things that need to be a part of our lives. Help us tonight. Oh God, I pray that by your grace tonight, if we have any, if any of us in this room have a root of bitterness that's taking root already in our lives, that by your grace it would be dealt with tonight. We don't want a conscience that our, our perception is off, our perception is interrupted. The enemy becomes the partner of our perception and skews our perceptions. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Challenge you young people, especially those of you that are still living at home, challenge you not to let relationships live in your life that don't need to be there and then you cut off the relationships that need to be there you, you cut off the voice of your parents you you cut off the voice of leaders that God has placed in your life you you let live what needs to die and then you kill what you need to live in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. For like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your home. Word of God, speak. Would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in. Place. Please 
let me stay and rest in your home. Oh, word of God, speak. Would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your home oh word of god speak pour down like rain washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of god speak pour down like rain washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of god speak would you pour down like rain washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your home Word of God, speak, pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest. Your holiness, word of God, speak. Pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know you're in this Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know. You're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. If you need to go or want to go, you're welcome to. There's still some folks praying throughout the sanctuary, so we're not going to officially dismiss yet. But in Jesus' name. Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah hallelujah in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus hallelujah hallelujah Jesus, in the name of Jesus, 
Let your grace work in us. Let your grace work in our lives, Lord. Don't let your grace fail. Don't help us to not allow your grace to fail. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name.